Welcome back to another episode here in the Equity Trust Virtual Classroom. My name is John Bowens, and in today's program, we're going to be talking about the eight things that everybody should know about a Roth IRA. As we speak of frequently here in the virtual classroom, compounding interest in the absence of taxation. It's incredibly powerful, and we want to make sure you understand how the Roth IRA can potentially benefit you. As always, in this episode, we answer one of our viewers' questions at the very end. Make sure you drop your questions in the comments box. Also, subscribe to the channel and hit the little bell icon. That way we can alert you to all of our upcoming videos. So let's get started. Okay, our first item is after-tax and tax-free characteristics. See, when funding a Roth IRA, the money is deposited after tax, meaning no tax deduction. It grows tax-free, and then when you take the money out after the age of 59 and a half, and assuming the account is season for five years, all of your distributions are tax-free. Now, let me give you an example of how powerful this can be. I have two clients from Dayton, Ohio, Investor A and Investor B. And Investor A and B got together to acquire a property, renovate the property, and sell for a profit. This was a shorter-term transaction. They bought the property and put in all total about $100,000. Now, Investor A only had about $13,000 and some change in his Roth IRA. Investor B had a lion's share of the amount of money necessary for the purchase and rehab. So they came together, they partnered on the transaction. Investor A, with only about $13,000 and some change, after they sold the property for $180,000, recognizing an over $60,000 profit, Investor A made over $34,000 tax-free in his Roth IRA. So he grew his Roth IRA from about $13,000 and some change to over $47,000, and he paid 0% tax. Now, so as long as he keeps the Roth IRA for five years and he attains the age of 59 and a half, he can then at that point take a distribution from the Roth IRA and he pays 0% tax. You also learn about how he could potentially leave this to children or grandchildren in a tax-free capacity. So when we talk about compounding interest in the absence of taxation, that's exactly what we're talking about. Now, let me take it a step further and give you a numerical example of how powerful this can be. Let's say that we put away $6,000 into an account every single year for 25 years. So we have $6,000 we're putting into account every single year for 25 years. I didn't tell you what type of account yet. I'm just saying I'm putting it into an account. Now let's compare and contrast. Let's say we put that $6,000 into a taxable account. And let's apply a rate of return, a compounding return of 10%. Let's also factor in a tax rate of 25%. Over the course of 25 years, if I apply a 10% return in taxation of 25%, I will have saved about $441,000, almost $442,000. Now that's in a taxable environment. So keep in mind that 25% tax, every year as we make our return, our 10% return, we have to pay taxes on that profit. In this example, I'm using a 25% tax basis. So again, that was $442,000. Now let's take the same contributions, $6,000 going into a Roth IRA every single year for 25 years. We're going to apply the same variables. We're gonna apply a 10% return, and then we're gonna factor in 25% tax rate. Now. Keep in mind with a Roth IRA, we effectively eliminate the variable of taxation on our compounding growth and on our returns. So over a 25 year period, that Roth IRA, given those variables, will grow to nearly $650,000. That is over $207,000 in tax savings in the Roth IRA. So when we talk about compounding interest in the absence of taxation, that is a great numerical representation of how that works. All right, number two, high income earners can still have a Roth IRA. Oftentimes I'll have folks that will come to me that will say, John, I'm being told that I make too much money, I am over the modified adjusted gross income limits and I don't qualify to contribute to a Roth IRA. So what is the modified adjusted gross income limits? Well, you can go to the IRS website, irs.gov, and you can look this up on your own. But to give you an example, if you are married filing jointly 
and you make over $218,000, you will not qualify to make a full contribution to a Roth IRA. That's $218,000 modified adjusted gross income. So for those that make too much money, they can consider what's called a backdoor Roth IRA. So what's a backdoor Roth IRA? Well, the first step of the process is to contribute to a traditional IRA, which does not have those MAGI restrictions in terms of contributions being made. So you contribute first to a traditional IRA, and then you immediately convert over to a Roth IRA. Your net effect is after-tax dollars. And I've seen folks doing this since 2010 because that's when the law changed. Again, that's called a backdoor Roth IRA. We, of course, would encourage you to talk to your CPA or tax accountant as you're going through these money movements. All right, number three, you can convert funds from a traditional to a Roth IRA. So I just talked about the backdoor contribution, which is contributing to a traditional and converting to a Roth. But what if you have tax deferred money now? Maybe you have a 401k, 403b, thrift savings plan, and it's all tax deferred. Maybe you have a traditional IRA, rollover IRA, maybe a SEP IRA, SEP IRA, or a simple IRA. You can convert those funds as is into a Roth IRA. Now, of course, you're going to have some tax consequences associated with this money movement because you're going from tax deferred to tax free Roth. So for example, let's say you have $100,000 in your traditional IRA and you want to convert that over into a Roth IRA. The $100,000 is converted over to the Roth IRA and then that $100,000 is added to your ordinary income and then you pay taxes accordingly. So let's say your effective tax rate all in is 20%. 20% of $100,000 is $20,000. So the $100,000 goes to the Roth IRA, and then when you file your tax return, you're going to pay $20,000 in taxes. Now, your tax rate might be different. That's just the example of a 20% effective tax rate. Now, keep in mind that if you withhold money from the account for the conversion tax, if you're under 59 and a half, there's going to be a 10% premature withdrawal penalty and ordinary income taxes. So what some folks consider is converting the entire amount over and then paying the taxes separately. Additionally, they have the benefit of retaining more tax exempt or tax qualified dollars in that account. So some folks don't wanna devalue their IRA, they wanna keep as much money in that account as possible. All right, that takes us to number four, which is you can convert money in stages. So I just mentioned converting an entire traditional IRA, in my example, 100,000 to a Roth IRA. Well, what if you had a $100,000 traditional IRA and you converted, let's say, $20,000 in year one, $20,000 in year two, $20,000 in the year three, so on and so forth, and spread out your tax burden over multiple years? You could certainly do this. In fact, I have a client, a real estate investor out of Texas who did this over the course of about four years. He was a property investor, a buy and hold investor. He buys rental properties using his self-directed traditional and Roth IRA. Now he started with a 403B, he was a college professor. He rolled over his 403B into a traditional IRA. He bought his first rental property. He was generating cash flow, which was going back into the traditional IRA. Everything was working out well for him. He then decided to convert over about 75,000 of his about a half a million dollar traditional IRA. So he converted 75,000 over into the Roth IRA. He paid the taxes on that 75,000. He bought a property for about $64,000, put about $10,000 worth of work into it, and all of the cash flow from the tenants flowed back into the Roth IRA, no taxation. If he eventually sells those properties, there's no long-term capital gains tax, no recapture depreciation. So he converted in that first year the $75,000. Then in the following year, he converted some more money over, bought another property, and then in the following year after that, he converted some more money over and bought another property. So now he has three rental properties in his Roth IRA and one property in his tax deferred account. So he has a significant amount of tax free, about 33,000 flowing into his Roth IRA, and then he still has some money flowing into his tax deferred account. And what he was able to do there, as you can see, is spread out his tax burden over those three years as he was converting and then acquiring properties. So that is a technique that you could also review with your CPA regarding converting in stages over multiple years in order to 
spread out your tax burden. Keep in mind as we get closer to the end of the year as well, you might consider converting a little bit just before the end of the year and then convert some after the turn of the year. And now you've effectively put that conversion into 2024. All right, number five, whatever you contribute to a Roth IRA, you can distribute tax and penalty free. This is interesting. This is sort of like a safety net. So let's say, for example, you put $6,000 today into a Roth IRA and you start to grow the account. And then a few years later, you determine that you really need that money, that initial principal contribution. Even while you're under the age of 59 and a half, you can distribute whatever amounts you've contributed to a Roth IRA. Again, that's an interesting safety net, especially for those that are in the younger generations. I speak to a lot of folks that are in situations where they feel that if they put money in, they're now going to be locked up into keeping that money into the account until they're 59 and a half and they won't have access to it. As we talked about here with the Roth IRA, you have that sort of safety net provision that allows you to access your principal contribution. All right, number six is spousal contribution. So keep in mind that yes, you have to have earned income to contribute to an IRA. Well, what if you have a spouse that doesn't have earned income or maybe your spouse has earned income but you're the one that doesn't have earned income? Well, that's okay. As long as you're married filing jointly, the other spouse's earned income can support the non-earned income spouse's contributions. So let's say I don't have income, but my wife has income and she has enough income. She can open up her Roth IRA, make a contribution. Separately, I open up my own Roth IRA and I use her earned income to contribute to my Roth IRA. In the year 2023, you can contribute up to $6,500 to an IRA, Roth or traditional. In this case, we'll just say Roth IRA. If you're 50 and over, you can contribute up to 7,500. So that means we can have 6,500 going into my spouse's Roth IRA and then 6,500 going into my Roth IRA. All right, number seven, you can self-direct. Of course, Equity Trust, we are a self-directed alternative asset custodian, which means you can invest in private equity, private companies. You can utilize our online wealth bridge tool and invest in private asset platform investment opportunities. You have the ability to invest in gold and silver, digital assets like cryptocurrency. And I gave you a few examples of real estate, owning real estate. You could also be a private money lender. You can lend money secured by real estate to other real estate investors and entrepreneurs. You can invest in real estate joint ventures and partnerships. So there's all different ways in which you can take control and you can self-direct these Roth IRAs into a variety of alternative investments. And again, that's exactly what we do here at Equity Trust is we allow investors to take control, make decisions on their own, and invest in the assets that make the most sense for them. All right, and then last but not least, number eight, you can leave a legacy, estate planning and legacy planning. So keep in mind that a Roth IRA, if structured properly, you can leave that Roth IRA to your children, potentially your grandchildren, and it can be left to them tax-free because it's a tax-free Roth IRA. Now, think about this. Let's say you grow your Roth IRA to a million dollars, and then you leave that a million dollar Roth IRA to a child. That child would inherit the Roth IRA, and they would have to distribute all the money and assets within a 10-year period. There's a new 10-year rule that started under the SECURE Act that was passed, which for non-spousal individuals that are inheriting an IRA, they have to distribute all the money in 10 years. In fact, we have an entire YouTube video all on this particular subject that you can check out. So if you leave it to a child, they do have to withdraw it within a 10-year period, but it is still tax-free to them. So you'll find that a lot of investors pursue the Roth IRA not only as a vehicle for planning for their retirement, but also as a vehicle to be able to leave a legacy to their children or grandchildren in a 100% tax-free capacity. All right, let's move on to our question of the day. Our question is from McCleave8393 that posted a question on YouTube here. They said, when doing a SEP to Roth conversion, do I owe taxes on the full amount converted? Uh, short answer, yes. So in this case, they have a SEP IRA, which is similar to a traditional IRA. It's tax deferred. So if they converted their entire balance to a Roth IRA, just like our example before, let's say it's $100,000 in a SEP IRA and they convert that entire $100,000 to the Roth, 
they would pay taxes on that 100,000. That 100,000 would be added to their ordinary income and then they would pay taxes accordingly. I hope you enjoyed today's episode. Make sure you drop your questions in the comments box. Drop your comments in the comments box. Make sure you hit subscribe, hit the little bell icon. Until the next episode, always leverage compounding interest in the absence of taxation.